ahead of myself on the chat but yeah the beard disappeared Johnny it happens every once in a while I just wake up in the morning and it's gone uh, don't know how it happens but it's best not to question these things we got a bunch of folks in the chat a lot of regulars a lot of new faces which I love to see if this is your first time here let me know let me know where you're coming from if you so desire uh, I got folks from all over the world I'm in Portland Oregon we got Denise we got Jim Georgia we got Edward Lewis, Indiana, Andy, Seth, Angel from India, Heidi, good to have you here. Heidi just got from Pennsylvania, just got a new mandolin on Thursday. Awesome. Welcome to the wonderful world of mandolins. California, Dance Tune, good to have you here. England with Alex, Julia in Germany, good to have you. Alan in London. It has been a while. Yeah, it's been got some some updates going on here. Got some questions rolling in. Ken from the California Central Coast. Joseph from Trinidad and Tobago. Tobago? To I don't know how to say the second word. Uh, I know where that is, but I just realized uh, I'm going to go with Tobago, but I'm not sure. Let us know. How do you pronounce it, Joseph? Uh, thanks for tuning in. Plymouth, Mass. The Oval Hole. Yeah, this is a uh, new acquisition that we can talk about. Vancouver Island. Sherry, good to have you here. Terry from Colorado. Sheldon from Minnesota. Bluebird, one, two, three. Good to have you here. Uncle Bobby, a new axe. Yes, indeed. Good eyes. Seth from North Carolina. Johnny from Ireland, good to have you here. All sorts of great folks from all over. What is the name of the tune that I started with? I started with a tune called Tam Lin, also known as Glasgow Reel. It's the tune of the week, so we're going to jam on it at the end. There's also lessons on my website, mandolessons.com, where you can learn it and play, play around with it. See London, James, good to have you here. Algeria, awesome. Ma Masanisa, probably not saying your name right. I apologize, but thank you so much for joining us. I don't know that we've had anyone from Algeria before. That's very cool. Peter, Joseph, Keith, I can't even keep up. That's what I like when the chat goes so fast that I can't keep up. All right. 
Yeah, Angel, ask any time. That's the way these work. So if anyone is new here, the way these work is you ask questions, I've got answers. And if I don't, I'll make something up or just tell you I don't know the answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, no question is too simple, no question too advanced. Uh, it's all fair game. Just here to chat music and hang out with you all for an hour. So, just as a quick little update, the reason I haven't been, it looks kind of similar back there, but this is actually a whole new house. The reason I haven't been here in a couple weeks is I had to move across town. Still in Portland, Oregon, but uh, moved across town, so that's always a, a project. I've been doing a lot of that three times in the last two years now, which is kind of a drag, but this place hopefully is going to stick around for a while. So, I'm um, still dialing it in. Um, gotta work on every time I change houses I gotta figure out new settings and put up sound proofing and all the different stuff there is to do but uh, hopefully every time it gets a little bit better so we'll, we'll see so if there's any technical issues I apologize but do let me know in the chat if you see any funny business because this is my I did a little patron only live stream last minute last night just to uh, make sure it would actually work but uh, a couple of you were there it's great to see you they got a little sneak peek at this thing so yeah, my normal Ellis kind of got matching twins now. This is the one you see all the time uh, from 2009 and Ellis A5. I just got this thing used, um, and it is a A4, which is kind of maybe a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, that's what Tom Ellis, the builder, calls it. But uh, A4s traditionally are, are um, a, a mandolin from the early teens made by Gibson. Um, and usually A styles have like a fingerboard that's flat to the top of the instrument. I'll see if I can get this in a different angle. So usually like on my old Gibson, which isn't out at the moment, um, you know, the, the fingerboard is flat to the top, which is common in a lot of instruments from the early 1900s. Um, but this is built kind of more, uh, with more modern specifications. So it connects at the 15th fret rather than the 12th. Um, the 12th being kind of the older style. It's got the raised fingerboard, but it's got the oval hole. Uh, so uh, I couldn't couldn't pass this thing up when I saw it pop up for sale. Um, and I've been really enjoying getting getting to know it. All right, so I saw a couple of questions pop up here. I'll do my best to keep up with the chat. It looks like it's really flying along today. So. Uh, that is great news. If I ever miss your question, just feel free to throw it back in the chat and I'll do my best to get to it. Why do you recommend learning by ear? A question from Jim. I think there's a number of reasons. One is kind of the traditional aspect of it because, you know, that's the way these tunes, all the music that I play for the most part, um, is from an oral tradition where writing the tune down isn't really, um, wasn't the way people learned. Um, you know, it was just sort of... Um, you know, it, it dates back to really early times when it wasn't, you know, people didn't know how to read music. They're often, you know, the, the music notation system might have been different if you get back into like early music in the 1400s. Um, you know, there's all these different staffs, uh, musical staffs and notation systems. So, you know, I think it's, if you can just learn it by ear, that's kind of all part of the tradition. It also, um... You know, I, I find for myself that if I learn a tune off of sheet music or tablature, it um, doesn't stick with me as well. It's like if I, if I learn a tune by ear, it really sticks in my head. But I find that if I learn a tune from written music, then I sort of feel that I need the written music to sort of look at and be like, oh, yeah, this is how it goes and follow it along. And it doesn't I don't I don't kind of get to own the tune in the same way. And, you know, I found that if I learn music by ear and then I have to bring the music around with me in order to to play it um, that kind of becomes a bit of a crutch it takes me out of the moment of just playing music with friends and also if I ever like if I lose my music I'm out of luck but if you if you learn it by ear and you've got it in your head um, then it's it's yours so that's those are a couple of the big reasons and it's, it's also just how I kind of grew up learning music was through that kind of oral tradition so it's, it's what I'm used to all right let's see cool 
cool. Johnny says, thanks for the trad Irish tunes. I love I love Irish music. I've been playing a lot of Irish music out here. I've met some new Irish picking friends, and uh, we've been having a lot of fun playing outdoors while the weather's still nice. So yeah, the tune I started with is uh, Glasgow Reel, or also known as Tam Lin. Also available on the website. Yep, uh, Keith says missed the last couple weeks. Me too. It's been three weeks since I did one of these, so you haven't missed much. And you can always go back and watch these if you, you know, maybe you can't make the whole thing or you want to watch some old ones. They're all available to watch back at any time. And Denise, who's in the chat, does some amazing kind of bookkeeping on all these lessons and uh, makes episode guides where she uh, links to all the tunes that I play and kind of has a list of all the topics that we cover. Oh, and I wouldn't be able to keep it straight uh, without her, so thanks to Denise. Do I know any hymns on the mandolin? Not so much, no. Do we have a graded exam? Nope. This is, uh, this is no grades. It's all about having fun and uh, playing music, so <laughs> no. There will be no test. The only test is if you're having a good time and finding some folks to play along with. Any easy, inexpensive soundproofing we can do to a room? Great question. One moment. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so there's a couple different things going on with soundproofing, and I'm no expert by any means. Um, I just kind of throw a lot of foam on the walls and it helps. So the, the thing to know about kind of soundproofing is, um, at least what I'm trying to do here, is not make it so sound can't get in. It's more of, um, you know, that, that requires kind of filling your walls with extra insulation and special insulation and, you know, making it so sound can't get into the room. That's not really what I'm doing and I don't know a whole lot oops, about that. What I'm doing is more kind of sound treatment. So, like, when you probably have the experience of, like, getting moving into a new house or standing in a totally empty room with no furniture, and you clap, and it's just like, blah, 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 and there's all these reflections off the walls, and it sounds kind of echoey. I've still got, I haven't put up all the soundproofing, which is why I can show you. I just get a bunch of this stuff. Um, you can use egg cartons. Um, or sorry, not, uh, it's kind of like egg egg foam um but this stuff i got online it's not wildly expensive um it was like i mean it's, it's, it's weird because it's just foam but it's also like not you can get really expensive stuff that's like hundreds and thousands of dollars which makes sense if you're in like a real studio environment but for me working in pretty small rooms with a lot of stuff in them already i have this stuff it costs like 50 bucks maybe 75 bucks for um, enough of this stuff to sort of make this room sound less echoey, which is, I only have four pieces up right now because I put them up with these little 3M command strips um, that don't do any damage to the walls and they come off easy. And so what I'm doing in here is I'm just putting them kind of out of view, right? My uh, cameras and microphones are backed into a corner, so I've put a, a whole bunch up kind of behind my cameras put a bunch up on the ceilings and out of view on the wall so it doesn't look <laughs> I try to kind of create a little scene behind me but also just outside of the frame there's often kind of mayhem of soundproofing that it doesn't look as cool as <laughs> the background in general does great question though and I, again I'm not there's a whole science and art to kind of putting soundproofing in the right spot I don't know a whole lot about that I pretty much just work in this small room and put up a lot, of, a lot of foam on the walls. Uh, great question from Uncle Bobby, a music theory question. You see the key signature for D major, so that would be two sharps. D, E, F sharp, G, A, D, C sharp, D. But then I'm saying, maybe in my lessons, that this tune is in A mixolydian, which would sound like this.
So that was a tune called uh, Fine Times at Our House. And that tune is in A Mixolydian. So A Mixolydian has the same number of sharps and flats as D major. Um, it's, it's got a C sharp and it's got an F sharp. And so going up the scale, you have A, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G natural, A. So a regular A major would be A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A. But Mixolydian is flatting that seventh note of the scale. A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G natural, A. Gives it a little kind of bluesy quality. So it has the same numbers of sharps and flats as D major. It's a mode um, kind of associated with the, the notes of a D major scale. Um, so often you'll see, you know, two sharps and flats in the key signature, and you'll say, okay, it's in D major, but then I'm saying it's an A, or it's written that it's an A. What's that all about? Um, and how do you figure that out? Um, often you can look to the last note of a part or of the tune. So in the case of uh, Fine Times, the A part and the B part end on an A note. Or you can look at the chords, and often the chords will end on an A chord rather than on a D chord. Hope that's helpful. Am I holding the A4 a little higher? That's a good question. It might be what I did. Let's find out. So it's like, it's just that much off screen. You guys might be able to tell better than me. Here's the A5. Uh, well, it's about the same. might be sitting a little lower. What I did was I just like perfectly matched the, the strap length. I kind of cut it down to size and the strap on the A4 is new and this one is, this is like the first strap I think that I ever got on any mandolin. So this strap's like over 20 years old um, and it's stretched out over time. So um, that one's a little tighter, you know, if you, especially if you look like right here, this is so worn in. Um, it really looks different. I think also the material has changed a little bit over the years of the the material of the strap itself. The leather kind of got not quite as nice, but um, this one is still very stiff. So I think it will sit a little higher, but I, I wanted to uh, give it a little space to kind of stretch out into. But it's close. Yeah, I guess it is Yeah, a little, little bit higher. But I kind of gave myself a little room to let this strap break in. Yeah, that's uh, some eagle eyes there, Lewis. I like it. Cross-picking ideas for different traditional tunes. That's a great idea. It's kind of a whole subject, I guess. I guess it depends on kind of whether you're thinking like Irish tunes or old time tunes. Um, will have different kind of sounds. So if you have a specific, or maybe a specific tune in mind, kind of throw it out there and I can talk about it. Hitting the high B cleanly on the octave is hard. I can only do it by sliding up. Any tips from Alex? So you're talking on the octave mandolin with like a longer scale length? I don't have an octave mandolin nearby, but I've got a long scale. It's just, you're not going to be able to hear it because it's electric, but uh. So it's hard because this, this is tuned differently. This is a D instead of an E. But, um, you know, if you're using, it depends. Are, are you using one finger per fret? Like, like that? Or are you doing mandolin fingering? So sometimes if you're using like mandolin fingering with your third finger on the fifth fret, I just reach for it. But also if you're... 
you can kind of practice that jump of uh, it, it, I, I would say kind of stick with it you got kind of requires you to like kind of troubleshoot your own technique to figure out what's working best for you um, you know really work on those shifts the more you do those shifts the easier they'll become I would say avoid sliding unless you want that sound because sliding is really a what is it called <laughs> sorry I got a little, <clears throat> a little grape skin in my mouth I uh the house we moved into has this huge really uh productive grapevine outside so I've been eating tons of grapes and apparently I still got some grapes in my teeth um but what are we talking about <laughs> uh oh yeah the B I would say you know avoid sliding for the B because that's definitely it's a good sound but you want to like make a choice to make that sound so if you're always doing that you're always going to get that slide so see if you can figure out a technique on the octave to shift your hand around a little bit to get that nice clean sound without um, without sliding so that you have the option to slide or not slide rather than always feeling like you need to like jump for it and I I fall into that trap too sometimes if I'm not paying attention to my own technique on longer CL instruments I do find myself like oh I gotta slide to that note and then kind of reminds me to sit down and do some practice to get those nice and easy Param, probably not saying your name correctly, but thank you so much for joining. Yep, uh, Keith says I occasionally use notation to get fine details of a tune I've learned by ear. Yeah, that definitely um, can help sometimes, especially on kind of more complex tunes. Um, also, what I find is like I'll learn a tune by ear from a recording and then I'll play it for a couple of years and kind of not think about it and then I'll go back to the recording and hear so much more that I kind of missed the first time around because I was focusing on the, the skeleton of the melody and really kind of getting the tune under my fingers and then you can go back and say oh wow now I can hear all these little details that I couldn't before because I was so focused on, on just the basics. Betsy, good to have you here. How was the move? It was pretty good. It's never fun, but we got it done. All the stuff's in the house, and uh, we are slowly unpacking, getting some new furniture, or used furniture, but uh, getting some furniture so we actually have things in the house. We've kind of been, since we moved to the West Coast in February of 2020, we've been mostly kind of staying in houses that were already furnished, uh, that were associated with friends so we don't have a whole lot of our own furniture um, but now it's we're starting to collect a little it's, it's gonna be nice though I like this house awesome Seth says just got a new tenor guitar in CGDA which has been great I know it's not a Mando but can you provide some info about them yeah I love tenor guitars I don't do I I do have a tenor guitar here um So here's a tenor guitar for anyone unfamiliar. I don't know how in tune it is. I haven't actually played it since I took it out of the case. Yeah, not bad. So um, Seth is talking about CGDA tuning, which is kind of like mandola tuning, um, but on a long 23 inch scale, or tenor guitars can vary, but a, a common scale is 23. Uh, I tune my tenor guitars closer to octave mandolin G D A and then rather than an E I have a D on top so I kind of do a lot of backing but the kind of the traditional um, tenor guitar tuning is CGDA, uh, kind of coming from tenor banjo background, the early 1900s, when tenor banjo was a popular instrument in jazz ensembles. 
But then the guitar got popular, and there are all these tenor banjo players out of work, so they made four-string guitars um, tuned like a tenor banjo, and then all the fingering was the same for all those tenor guitarists out there. I'm just going to catch up with the chat. Love to see it cruising right along. I need to move this a little closer to me, but I don't want the... Is that out of the view? Yeah. Where did you get your armrest? My armrest... Put this thing down. This has been kind of a show and tell one, but uh, we'll get around to some music soon. And if people ever have requests I forgot to mention at the beginning <coughs> throw them out there as long as they're traditional and not copyrighted and I have to remember how they go but other than that fair game so armrests this is an armrest made by uh, Doug Edwards of Hill County Stringworks and it's called the McClung M-C-C-L-U-N-G and I like it because it's got a little bit of kind of angle to it um Rather than just being kind of a flat thing, I've gotten used to them. I put them on all the instruments, all my mandolins. They're not required by any means. I, I got in the habit because I had a mandolin with really sharp edges on the binding, um, and it was kind of uncomfortable for my arms, so I got an armrest for that reason, and now I've just become used to them. A lot of people like them, but they're not, not required unless you're looking for it. Hey, Andrew with the super chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate the support. And Uncle Bobby as well. Thank you guys for the support. Um, there's a bunch of different ways people can support me, which is greatly appreciated. There's the super chat, which Andy and Uncle Bobby have figured out. I don't really know anything about how they work, but um, I appreciate them when they come through. There's also links in the description if PayPal or um, is something like that is more your style. I've got PayPal, Venmo. I've got links to merch. If you need a t-shirt or a mug something like that or you can join us on patreon there's a bunch of patrons in the chat here where you get access to lessons early patron only live streams i gotta schedule that one for this month um and all sorts of fun stuff so thank you all for the support however it comes through greatly appreciated helps me make new lessons and do live streams like this Yeah, the F hole, kind of comparing the F and oval hole sound. Yeah, this the F hole definitely has a lot kind of drier sound, a little more kind of projection while not being as kind of warm and rich sounding. Um, that's sort of the general the way that I think about it as well. Yeah, James says, best description of modes I heard was notes may be the same as the relative major. The chord progression lays down uh, some cont contextual differences. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, kind of thinking, again, you can look to, like, the last chord in the tune. Like, is it ending on an A chord, but it's got the notes of D major? Well, it might be an A mixolydian. Wow, Becky uh, noticed the, the mandolin height. <laughs> right. Good eyes, Becky. Also, hello. Good to hear from you. What year was the new mandolin made from Denise? This was made in 2010. So it's, um, I don't know exactly when, but it, my, uh, the, uh, the Ellis, the A5 with F holes was made in 2009. This was made in 2010. I don't think this thing has seen as much playing as my A5 because that thing... I put so many hours into the A5, and I think this, this mandolin has bounced around to a couple different owners over the years. Um, so I'm looking forward, even in the time that I've had it and kind of set it up to my specifications, it's uh, it's kind of started to change a little bit. I want to try some heavier strings on it. It's got J74s right now, but I've got J75s, a little heavier gauge on the F-hole mandolin. See if this one likes those as well. It may, may not. 
Oh, nice. Alex has a themed set he's working on. Harvest Home, Harvest Moon, and John Barleycorn. Oh, other Harvest tunes. There's a tune, there's a Harvest Polka. I don't know it off the top. I, I've played along with it, but maybe other people in the chat know other Harvest tunes. Um, other Harvest tunes. Yeah, you definitely picked the, the three that I kind of popped into my head. But yeah, Harvest Polka is a very cool tune. And other people, if you know a Harvest tune or song, throw it in the chat for, for Alex. You might end up with a really long set, Alex. <laughs> Shady Grove for that cross picking idea. I think there's like a couple things in the same way that like adding double stops to kind of fill in a tune you got to know a couple things to get into cross picking because um, cross picking is ultimately double stops just not at the same it's kind of like double stops are to cor chords are to double stops as like arpeggios are to cross picking <coughs> excuse me I already drank all my coffee so I have nothing to sip um, so you need to know the melody of Shady Grove, uh, my approximation. So kind of A minor, and then you got to know the chords. kind of put some of that stuff together look for those open holes in the tune so you have so that's a whole lot of a at the beginning you go so we've got that a minor cross picking then we got this big e chord uh e note still on an a minor I'd say look for the holes, like the long notes, the the space in the tune, and then start trying to work on like a down up, down up, down up, down up cross picking pattern on that. A ragtime tune on the oval hole. Let's see, rag. I don't know too many like true ragtime tunes, but um, I know some kind of raggy tunes. Um, how about like East Tennessee blues? It's kind of raggy. Um,
some other names that I can't remember off the top of my head, but a fun one. Hey, JJ, good to have you here. Thanks for tuning in. Good to see ya. Spen says, beginner question, you have one hour to practice. You have chords, songs, scales, picking techniques. How do you break down the hour? Great question. Um, ultimately, I think my personal focus, which isn't a very specific answer to your question, just to start off, is to have to like kind of make it as enjoyable as possible for yourself. So, you know, if you're saying, if you've set up a schedule of like, you've, you've kind of analyzed your own playing, figured out what it is you need to work on. And it seems like you have, because you know, you want to work on chords, you want to work on songs, scales, picking technique, etc. You know, having that list is great, but if you're sitting there saying, okay, I got to practice scales, man, I hate scales. I, I don't like them at all. Sitting there and saying, okay, well, I'm going to do an entire hour of scales because because it's something I really need to work on, but you're not enjoying it, that's not a great um, uh, kind of way to feel good about playing an instrument. Because ultimately, that's, that's what these things are for, is enjoyment, you know, have fun playing with them. So I try to match my own practice with whatever I'm interested in, and I find my interest varies. Like, sometimes I'm, I'm thinking, oh yeah, I really, you know, I, I could work on some scales. That sounds pretty fun right now. And I'm like, oh, but I really should work on arpeggios, but I don't want to work on arpeggios right now. For myself, I just kind of follow my own interests just so I get to the end of the hour and say, hey, I had fun and I worked on something um, and improved my skills. But, you know, I didn't feel like it was a chore because as soon as it's a chore, that becomes a little less fun. And, you know, the more you play, there's times where playing is going to feel like a chore. But for me, I really only try to make those times when I like need to learn something it, it kind of comes with more of kind of like needing to be a professional musician I think to kind of make it a chore um where it's like okay I have all these tunes to learn I really need to learn them or I'm going to be asked to improvise in this particular way over this kind of scale or chord progression or um you know mode that I'm not familiar with I really gotta like sit down and it I need to do it now because this this project is coming up, you know, that can get, um, that's a, a good way to kind of force yourself to do it because, you know, you got to get it done. But, you know, in general, as just kind of the bulk majority of my time practicing, I really just try to like follow my interests, play a tune that I know just to kind of get warmed up, you know, maybe do a little right hand exercises and then say, okay, what was that tune I was working on the other day that I can't quite get all the way through? And say, okay, yeah, and, you know, play through it a couple times. Hey, all right, I've got that tune down. Do I know the chords? on the chords make sure you know them say okay i could really work on uh, that tune sounded good i've kind of got it under my fingers now but i could really work on some speed work on speed for a little i kind of let my practice time kind of if if it's up to me and i kind of get to do what i want with my practice time i just kind of let it evolve organically and kind of follow my own interests great question though and everybody does it a little different my big kind of guiding factor is try to have as much fun as possible while also working on the skills that you've uh, kind of figured out you need to work on. James says, I find it very difficult to concentrate when learning a new version of a tune I've already learned elsewhere. A bad habit I need to fix. I mean, that's... I've been talking about that a lot lately with... Especially in like Irish music, there's so many tunes that sound really similar and they're just kind of versions of the tune and it's hard because your your brain really will latch on to like the first thing you learn and then always try to revert to that so it's it's definitely good practice to try to get like another version of a tune into your head um so thumbs up for giving that a try but also you know it's it's not an easy thing to do 
And I don't even know if it's necessarily a habit, but if you can break the habit, tell me your secrets, because I don't know how to break that habit. <laughs> yeah, Angel Lee says, how to plan a practice session. I think I was kind of talking about that just a second ago, but if you have other specific thoughts, throw them in the chat and I'll get to them. What's the first instrument you unpacked in your new place and why? I think I pulled out the old trusty A5 Ellis just so I could play a couple tunes with Emma. After a couple days of hauling boxes for hours and hours. Hadn't played music in a couple days and pulled out this thing and played a couple tunes on our new porch. And then I think maybe the bazooki, the, the citern back there, just to back up some, some tunes as well. Ooh. Uh, Keith says, bazooki tuning, I do the same thing, but have a little pitch key to swap to G, D, A, E. Do you have like a, what do you mean by a pitch key? Do you have like a, a Scruggs tuner? That's an interesting idea. <laughs> um, or... I'm interested because yeah, is this is cool to be able to go back and forth between GDAD and GDAE. I have my I'm hooked enough on the D string that I put a heavier gauge string that won't go up to E, but I like the idea of quick change. Johnny says picked up mandolin last January as my first instrument. Oh, cool! And you got an Aunt D in Galway who's sending you new tunes to learn. <laughs> awesome yeah yeah getting some lightning fast tunes to try to to break down is definitely a project um that's where programs like uh, amazing slow downer or transcribe or there's also uh you know if you're getting mp3s there's a great website called tunetranscriber.com that you can upload any mp3 that's on your computer and it'll help you slow it down and break uh break it up into loops and things like that Cool, glad you're enjoying the site. Any chance you know the tune for a found, yeah, music for a found harmonium. Yeah, I, I don't really know that tune. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I don't really know. And then it changed like four parts and it changes keys into some flat stuff. That's a very cool tune. I don't really play it though. The Wise Maid. It's not on my list. It should be. Da, 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 da. I mean, I'm, I believe you that it's... Really whoops. Know. Hey, I'm, this is a video of myself. How does The Wise Maid go? <laughs> I'm gonna cheat here a little when I was trying to read it on a tiny screen. I'm just gonna listen to it. Wise. It's a great tune. I'm pretty sure I know it. Yeah. should add that one to the list. I should also learn it better myself. Let's see if I can get through it. Uh, 
I've got a little miss. That's a tune that I always just follow at sessions. Excuse me. I always just follow that tune at sessions and can't remember that little phrase, but I should get that one under my fingers. Drunken Sailor. I, I sort I sort of know that tune, but not really. Um, I know the song. I, I know of the song. I don't know any of any of the kind of words or anything, except for what would you do with a drunken sailor? Any sh good shanty esque tunes and from Ant Man? What I would recommend. I've got a good friend back in Maine, Bennett Kinesny, who has a website called worksongs.org and he's big into all manner of work songs which a lot of sea shanties are um and you can find a lot of information about he's got a bunch of sea shanties up on his website uh follow him wherever you can find him worksongs.org um is a good place to start and find out all kinds of good good songs of the sea Lewis said, I had a bit of a aha moment yesterday when you were talking about the 10 strings, C, G, D, A on the top four and G, D, A, E on the bottom. Tenor guitar tuning on one end and mandolin on the other. Exactly. Can I share my experience with the mandolin? I don't know exactly what you mean. Um, maybe how I got into it. I got into it because I heard the, uh, the first, they're the self-titled, I should say, Nickel Creek album um, back around the year 2000. I was like, hey, I like the sound of that instrument. I don't know what it is. I just know it's not a fiddle and it's not a guitar. And the family friend's house we were at, and they were like, oh, that's a mandolin. I've got one. I'll show you a couple chords. Sent me home with a, a banjo mandolin, just like I got back there. Uh, there. Um, and let me kind of borrow it for a little while and learn a couple chords. And it was, then I learned a lot by living in a small town, so I learned a lot just by going online and learning from the mandolin cafe and things like that eastman yeah gibby's got an eastman i love eastman's 305 those are i wish eastman's had been around when i started playing because they're real solid instruments or maybe they were around but they were not easily as easy to find as they are these days they're really making some nice stuff backed up a little and feel out of out of focus all right let's see jj says i need to change my strings ej 70s are heavier strings harder to play what are the pros and cons of heavy or light strings it can depend on the instrument so you know on an old instrument like this bowl back back here i would always have light strings because you know that thing's 100 years old and wasn't built for heavy gauge modern strings any mandolin like you know eastman or kind of modern built um kind of bluegrass style if it looks like this or an f style or an oval hole as long as it's kind of new um those can probably handle you know i i would say go to j74 i don't know what j70s are are those like extra light let me just look up here A medium light, interesting. Just want to look at the gauges. 38, 24, 15, 11. Okay. Yeah, so that, I would say you'd be fine to bump up to like J74s. What I find is with... Um, <laughs> lost my train of thought there. With heavier gauge strings, you're able to kind of like hit the strings harder and they won't kind of... Sa there's a certain kind of uh you can be more aggressive with the strings and they won't kind of buzz and fall apart it'll be a little harder under your left hand but as long as your action is you can also adjust like if you have light strings and high action um you can sometimes get away with medium gauge strings and a lower action or heavy gauge strings and a slightly lower action it doesn't necessarily you can usually adjust so it uh, is about as easy to play um, at least in terms of like the amount of pressure you have to use in your left hand. Um, but I'd say as long as you have a modern mandolin, try out J74s and see how those work for you. Nice. Brianne's got a bunch of easements. That's what I like to hear. It's hard to have just one mandolin. 
they're so little so easy to put into hide in closets and corners <laughs> all right lots of eastman folks here glad to see it Beverly Hillbillies theme song, Old Earl Scruggs. Uh, I don't I don't really know that one either. Yeah. Lots of Eastman's. All right, catch up with the chat here for a second. And then we should play a little, uh, I'll do a little lightning round through any more questions on the chat. And then let's get our mandolins out and tuned up if they aren't already to uh, jam on a little bit of Tam Lin. All right, let's see. William, yes, I do. I have a new mandolin. I'll play it for um, for Tam Lin. I really like this this one. You know, it's, it doesn't have like the same chop as the uh, the F hole, but I do like it for Irish tunes and some old time stuff. Not not as much of a bluegrass mandolin, but oh, I mean, Mike Compton has a bunch of old oval hole mandolins that he certainly makes work. There's a, who played somebody played an F two or an F four in a bluegrass context back in like the seventies and eighties. Can't remember who off the top of my head. Maybe somebody in the chat knows. Explain how a mandolin and a band should play on two and four count rather than one and three. Yeah, so that's just the kind of the you probably have heard the sound um, and maybe not just count, like thought about it in terms of like rhythm and music theory and math but so if you have four beats you have one two three four one two three four and then the bass in a general kind of bluegrass um is going to be going on the one and three so that's boom 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 and the mandolin is filling in where the bass isn't so it becomes Boom, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And that's where you get that chopping sound. Kind of, if, if the mandolin is chopping at the same time as the bass, you get boom, 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 which is very kind of heavy, stompy sound. But by putting the mandolin on the two and four on the backbeat, really kind of levels things out to boom, 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 one. That's a bit of a workout. But that's the general idea is to like kind of play on the backbeat to balance out the bass and other instruments that are really heavy on the one and three. All right, a couple more questions here, maybe. Yeah, I'll try to make a lesson on Wise Made, JJ. Ooh, can I play a Scandy tune? Sure, I'll do a Scandy tune real quick, and then I really got to get to the... Hey, thank you, Ed, for the super chat. Really appreciate it. I'll play a Scandy tune. Oh, can you play... Oh, you're, you picked my favorite tune. Uh, all right, I'll play, I'll play Devaney's Goat just because it's my favorite, favorite Irish tune at the moment. And then I'll play a Scandy tune. Uh, this one can go a little long. That's fine. If you got to leave, so be it. But uh, I'll stick around. A little extra long live stream on a Saturday morning, afternoon. Never hurt, especially in the new spot. Get it all dialed in. So Devaney's Goat. <laughs> No, that's not it. No, that's not, where is it? Uh, this is B part. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's too many tunes in the key of D. 
right, I'm gonna cheat. You gotta cheat to do it. Sometimes you just gotta. This is a tune I've been working on and I can't keep straight from a couple other ones. Here we go. Playing it too fast, couldn't get the triplets. Had to slow it down, take a little of my own advice. <laughs> Alright, a Scandi tune. Play a little of, uh, uh, just to mellow things out for a second. Uh, Grindhans Jaspads Polska. <laughs> it's a, a fun Scandi tune. I can spell it, but it'll take me 20 minutes, so I'll just. Uh, it's on, if you want to hear a band version, it's on my uh, band Velocipedes second album called Hunt the Squirrel. You can find those on my website if you want to hear my my bandmate Julia play it on the fiddle while I play it on the mandolin. So we play it in a funny key. Uh, this tune is usually either in G or C, um, but we played it in like E flat. We tuned way down. It was fun. But here's the tune in G.
Pods Polska. A Swedish tune. I learned originally from Andy Cutting, an English button accordion player. Seven Black Swans got a three point mandolin get on the way. That's very cool. I love three points. I've never gotten to play one, but man, they look cool. And you got medium gauge flat wounds. Yeah, flat wounds are a very fun, warm sound. Yeah, Frank Wake Wakefield, that's right. He plays an F4. Yeah, flat wounds can also be a little easier on the fingers for sure. I, I played with flat wounds for many years. Um, back when I had, if you're an early Mando lesson person or you've seen some of the early videos where I'm playing a Gibson A9, that kind of dark brown A style, I had flat wounds on that for years and years and years. All right, catch up with the chat here. Yeah, I was getting it confused with Made Behind the Bar. <laughs> they're, they're really similar. Um, yeah. All right, good to see you, Keith. All right, let's get all tuned up and play a little bit of uh, Tam Lin to finish off the hour here. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lewis. So yeah, if anyone, Lewis says, I noticed the long sleeve shirts aren't on the merch list anymore, not available any longer. They should be. Teespring just like changed their pricing a little bit and said like anything that changed in a certain way was going to get like kind of unlisted, but they wouldn't tell me which ones they were. And this happened while I was moving. So I don't actually, so if there's anything that used to be there that isn't anymore and you're looking for it, let me know and I'll go in and change it. I need to get back onto the website and kind of get things updated so everything shows up again. <laughs> All right, I, I had a feeling, Denise, you might like the Yaspod Spolska. <laughs> it's very syncopated. There's a whole lot of notes that aren't on the downbeat. <laughs> And a whole lot of downbeat that doesn't have a note. Speaking of, who was it? Edward was just saying. Somebody was, or was it Kenneth? That it was straight. Oh yeah, Kenneth was saying it's kind of strange when there's no beat on the one count. Um, that is true, and especially in that Polska, and in bluegrass. <laughs> Ooh, forked deer for next week's jam. I don't think we've done that one. Is that on my website? I feel a little self-conscious about the B part of that tune. Um, I'll check, though. Because if I've, t I've taught it, then I've probably taught it the way that I play. Fork. Yeah, I don't have it on the website. I've got a weird B part to it that I don't know where it came from, so I don't think I've ever done that tune. All right, enough rambling on my part. Let's uh, let's play some Tam Lin, key of D minor with some B flats and all sorts of good stuff. So I'll play the melody here, you play the chorus, then we'll swap. A2. I'll 
play the chord, you play the melody. do it we haven't done it yet great tune in the key of c popularized by james bryan um for next week so thank you all so much for hanging out uh i just saw something here oh lewis says with you working overtime i'm gonna be late to shannon and matt's jam um yeah say hello to them for me apologize that <laughs> i kept you here um yeah, and if anyone's looking for a nice, a sweet uh, Irish live stream, check. You can just YouTube Matt and Shannon Heaton, H E A T O N. Lewis is talking about it in the chat. There, I think they must be firing up now. Probably a little late. Thank you so much, Terry, for the super chat. Thank you so much, everyone, for the support. However, it comes through, or even if you're just playing, uh, you know, it's free for a reason. So, the more music, the merrier. As far as I'm concerned. Have a great week. I'll see you next weekend. Probably. Maybe not. Um, we'll find out. <laughs> Keep an eye on Mando Lessons. Uh, I'll try to let you know if I can't make it, and I'll try to post the uh, post the live announcement on Friday if I am going to make it. Have a great day. Have a great night. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. Bye-bye.